And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm on my way back. I'm at 39th and Truce, this place in Kansas City. And then I was like, and then my first thought was like, oh, he was out all night partying. I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, what a big deal. Not a big deal. And then he was like, oh, yeah, I'm on my way back from liturgy. And I was like, wow. whoa. Welcome to Royal Path. I am your host, Andrew, and today I'm here to ask Father in Cyprian uh, from the suggestion of a fan of the show, um, what would you say is the most uh, seminal, I think is the word that was used, a uh, seminal Bill Murray movie? Easy. Go Easy. ahead. Groundhog Day. Stop. Full stop. I kind of thought that would be the answer. Full stop. Quintessential. Lost in, tra Lost in translation is pretty good. Quintessential. Sorry, is the word. Quintessential Bill Murray, Murray, but it's the same thing. But I want to make the question correct. I would say Ghostbusters. Yeah, that would be second, probably. I think Ghostbusters is because he's just, I think that's peak Bill Murray for me. Um, and maybe because he doesn't, does he drink a lot in that movie? In Ghostbusters, not not re. Does he so drink I think, at all? I don't know. I it's been maybe a when he's on a when he's with Sigourney Weaver, like maybe they have a drink together. Maybe it's been that's it. Usually a decade and a half since I've seen that movie, but I remember that every time I see some like on a, like a YouTube clip or something like that of him talking, uh, like quotes from whatever from that movie, I'm like, yeah, that's that's the Bill Murray I like, like. Yeah, I could say Lost in Translation, but again, you fall into that whole, like, I don't know, this dude's just kind of like an old, miserable, drunk type of right. guy, and that's part of Bill Murray, sure, but, like, I don't know if I'm going anywhere with this. What about you, Father? Do you have, do you have one? It's Life Aquatic for Father. Yeah, I was going to say that's probably good. Life Aquatic. That's but, great. But what about uh, Private, was it, was he, was he Private Benjamin? Is that him? Yeah, I think it is. I think okay. it is. Yeah. No. I think, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. How long? Uh, you know, I had forgotten about Life Aquatic. Mm -hmm. I got a, oh man, Wes Anderson, right? Wes yeah. Anderson. Yeah. Man. Yeah. yeah. Groundhog Day is just, uh, to me, it's maybe it's the time, but if I really had to lay all the movies up against each other, as what's the what's the well i guess there's two different things like what's the best bill murray movie and what's the best movie bill murray has ever been in yeah and if it's the if it's the first one then i'm going groundhog day yeah. like what's the best bill murray movie if it's I'll what's agree. the best movie that bill murray has been in it's life aquatic no doubt yeah no doubt i still got to think ghostbusters has got to be in the mix there somewhere because that's just such a great it's movie. high and he's just like that perfect yeah but you know what the thing about ghostbusters is i think there's plenty of people and i'm on that spectrum who don't really know that much bill murray and everybody mm. knows bill murray from ghostbusters mm -hmm. so there's something about that there's something to be said for most people's understanding of him is going to be from ghostbusters i think you know i, just I mean you get it you get a good picture of him like his as like a character actor in that movie he does everything that he's going to do in all these other movies but he yeah. just in other movies he does it so much better yeah you know what part i really like from life aquatic is the part where he like slips and falls down the stairs and then lands and he's laying there and he's like are you okay and he's like no i'm not okay and he like starts talking about all this emotional stuff that's happening with him at that time that's like nothing to do with this fall like in early sobriety, I saw that part, and that was like an inspiration to me. And mm. I was like, "That I got to get on that level where I'm laying there, and I'm able to just be like, you know what? There's a bunch of stuff that I just need to talk about really quick. 
and it's like all just gotta be like open and honest like i did not like the way that that happened and i didn't like that thing and that really stunk and that's just a big source of how long do you think and we'll be done with this but how long do you think he was stuck in the time loop in groundhog's day that's a good question i mean he learned how to play piano So I think that's really, for me, that's the one thing that like clicks it off that he learned how to be like this amazing piano player. So we're talking months, man. I have heard. Maybe years. I have heard 10,000 years. Oh, stop. I have heard that that was a theory was that he was stuck for like thousands and thousands of years in that loop. And, you know, I have no idea. Again, it's usually been a decade and a half, two decades since I've seen that movie but it had a thousand years seems too long to me i mean but seems too long yeah i guess it's definitively too long because anyone who'd be stuck that long they they're (laughs) believe me their highest accomplishment wouldn't be playing piano (laughs) exactly exactly exactly, (laughs) figure it out some other pretty profound stuff so yes probably 10 years i would say 10 years That would be, I I think that's a reasonable, years, years is reasonable for sure. A decade is probably on the, that's the far end for me that I would go. But that's a great question. I wonder if anybody's ever asked Bill Murray that question. Like how how long he, because he's playing the character, right? So it's like, how long did you think that he had been there? Like on the, when it's the last day, like how long did you think he'd been there? I was just sitting there thinking about it. I was like, man, that's a great movie. It's a great film. I would not be shocked if I went the entire, entirety the rest of my life without seeing Groundhog's Day again, but I still like thinking about it. Like every once in a while, it's just like, what's the guy's name? And then we'll be done with this. But what's the guy's name? The inch, the salesman that he's like walks up to him and he's like Ned. I can't yeah, remember. Ned Ry- Ned Ryerson. Ned Ryerson. That's- Ned Ryerson. <laughs> Ned Ryerson. Yeah, no, that's a great movie. It's a great. Movie. It is good. Yeah. Are you not a big Groundhog's Day fan, Father? I don't think I've ever seen it in its entirety. Oh, man, wow, so good. Such a good film. It's a good yeah. one. It's a good one. It's one of those ones that's still like, you don't have to see it, but it's aged well. It's funny. Mm-hmm. And there's actually some depth. Because he, for like the first half of the second act, he just goes around and kills himself. Yeah. He just like jumps in front of trains. And yeah, like, that sounds like, um, uh, what was that Tom Cruise movie? Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow. But the, but it had a different name too, didn't it? Like it's got two names. Edge of Tomorrow, something, something, something. Yeah. Because they know. couldn't figure out the name. Yeah. That was it's like that. Movie. Yeah. Tom Cruise is one of those dudes that's like mm-hmm. anytime he's in the movie, I'm like, I'm out. And I don't know why. Yeah, we had this conversation before, didn't we though? Could be. Uh, then we can I'll, be- I just I'll start going down the list of all these great movies. Like, yeah, it's great. It's great. It's like, yeah, Tom Cruise in all these great movies. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that he's not been in great movies, but if there's a new movie coming out starring Tom Cruise, I'm generally just like, yeah, I'm out. Edge of Tomorrow is really good. Edge is of Tomorrow is okay. good. I'll yeah. check it out. I'll check the it out. one thing that you know about a Tom Cruise movie is that like everyone involved with the movie is going to be top of the industry. So it's like you're not in this day at this time in the last 15, 20 years, you're not going to get a Tom Cruise movie that doesn't have like Academy Award winning writers, like cinematographers who are at the top of their game, visual effects that are just sick. Like everything's amazing. Soundtrack that's that's great, you know. So it's like, yeah, it's Tom Cruise. Yeah, I'm not really that, you know, whatever. It's Tom Cruise, but. I mean, you guys, I I know we've talked about this because I'm telling you, man, I mean. Oh, we talked about Christopher Nolan. Well, well, I'm prepared to get a hate mail on this, but it's it's a lot like, you know, what? when I've, I've had some people because those are the circles I used to run in where people will tell me like, ah, Jimi Hendrix is overrated, you know? Man, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've met people like that. Because they don't. <sighs> they, wow. and they, they base that off of the kind of ubiquitous nature of Jimi Hendrix's name. Mm. right and so i i submit the same thing there's this kind of ubiquitous nature of tom cruise's name but Mm -hmm. in the same way i have this piece of evidence where i just go like okay this is why Jimi hendrix is incredible there's a song machine gun i feel like we've talked about this before speaking of groundhog's day but like Hmm. there's a song machine gun and there's this part it's like 
a minute and 36 seconds into the song. Not only are the lyrics incredible, and they have this like, there's this really noaic line there where he, it's about a Vietnam veteran. And there's a line in there where he says, evil man make me, evil man make me kill you. Even evil man make you kill me even though we're only families apart, you know? Really mm. profound, really good. But there's a part in there, it's like one minute 36 and he start. he goes into this solo and it is, it, it'll make your soul leave your body. It's crazy. Mm. Like it, he just holds this one note and it is, it is just insane. It's, it, it's insane. So anyways, so I go like, yeah, that's why Jimi Hendrix is Jimi Hendrix. But Tom Cruise, there's so many things I can actually point to this, but there is, if you've ever seen Magnolia, Mm -hmm. I haven't. Oh man, mm -hmm. man, Magnolia is an incredible movie. There's this one scene, and it's the same thing. People all over they roll their eyes at it, but he's at the he's at the uh, the bed, uh, the deathbed of his father, and he's just been this salacious, disgusting human being, and he's coming to this incredible kind of point of like. I don't know, this this point of awareness and his father's dying and there and it's just he barely says anything and just the way that he just a flood of just years of regret and anguish. It's incredible. It's an incredible scene. It, it's an incredible scene. And that that alone I go like see Tom Cruise is yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. I, I know crazy Scientology all that stuff, but like oh, sure. incredible, incredible actor, man. I mean he's a really man. great actor incredible actor he's a yeah. really great actor he's a really good actor man you mm -hmm. know so yeah but that that scene in, in magnolia magnolia is a great movie it's mm -hmm. hmm. i'm really sitting here trying to rack my brain of a movie where i could take the other side of my position of being like yeah i just don't really like it. i can't really what top what top top gun i mean come on i've never seen <laughs> top classic gun. you've never seen top gun no wow no. classic classic yeah i mean do you guys keep up with like the mission impossible franchise no i don't keep no. up with that franchise no no, no. I, don't I think i've seen two of them maybe i think i saw one i saw the yeah. very first one and i absolutely loved it when i was a kid you know it was mm -hmm. completely lost on me but i mean i i don't know i mean vanilla sky oh eyes man wide, vanilla eyes sky. wide shut eyes wide shut <sighs> come on man like these are yeah. eyes wide vanilla shut. sky he's incredible He's incredible in Vanilla Sky. Incredible. Eyes Wide Shut is a dirty movie, and I'm not going to watch it. I'm never. Yeah. It is. A, it is. It is a. It is a dirty movie, but it's. It. Well, it's. Yeah. On a lot. Of, on every level. <laughs> on every level. Yeah. On every level. But it's. Uh, I mean. But it's meant to be that dirty movie. It's not. It's not being dirty for. I mean, it's Kubrick being Kubrick. Yeah. Everything Kubrick does is. Uh, it's all dirty. Yeah. Okay. It's all Last dirty. Last question that I'm really done. Including is... the moon landing, by the way. <laughs> Including the moon landing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then, really quick, who then is the most overrated actor, in your opinion? You just do not get the hype. Uh, you know, that's, that's hard because I have this thing where even though there are people who are like, I don't get it, I don't like this guy, acting is tough. Will like Ferrell? A, <laughs> well, yeah. Will Ferrell. I was gonna. Uh, I was you gonna you would say that was that going to be your answer? answer? My answer remains unchanged. By the way, I've looked wow. up of his sketches and everything, and I'm just wow. like, all he does is talk about. <laughs> That's all he does. Oh uh, no, no, no! I can. I, I I know who Seth Rogen. Yeah, Seth Rogen. One hundred percent. He's, he's in saying, Pineapple Express. Yeah. Um, oh. he's like all the stoner, all the stoner, uh, the stoner uh, movies. Uh, Get it away from me. Yeah. <laughs> you just, you take it away. away. It's like a bad cold dish. I don't want anything to do with it. When Cyprian and I were debating about Will Ferrell, uh, I said he's like Seth Rogen, that yeah, he's not funny. Everyone else around him is funny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He just kind of sits yeah. there like a big kind of jerk. And his characters are always jerks, and I just don't get I don't get the hype. I don't know why. Well, it's what you, it's what you get when the because Seth Rogen always writes and like produces his own stuff. Yeah. So whenever you know Kevin Smith would be another one, and it's like if you're gonna judge their acting as an actor, they would net. It's like this guy's not even an actor. 
have you read have you read any of kevin smith's comic books father no mm. i haven't he does arrow his green arrow one is fantastic but yeah his green arrow is really good but and scene we're good <laughs> so um i think that we are on um the nicene creed mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember where we were at you said we were on and, and and suffered and was buried and suffered and was buried so was who was crucified he was crucified for us also under pontius pilate and suffered and was buried, buried. and on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures which right. was what i was a little bit wanting to maybe talk a little bit about with father um, so again, I'm just throwing this out there. This was okay. kind of the area I wanted to get down on, but that doesn't mean that this is what we have to talk about. Because okay. I'm curious, because to reference another podcast, um, one of the people, the hosts on that show, had talked about Christ's descent into Hades, mm-hmm. and like he was not even aware. And mind you not the thorny shade. This is a person who should have known that St. John, the forerunner went to Hades first mm-hmm. and let everybody know that Christ was coming. Mm-hmm. Not to throw any shade. That's okay. But this is a person who should have known that. Mm-hmm. And I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about, we, we could start off talking with about this or we don't have to talk about it at all, or we can save it till next time about like Christ's descent into Hades. Like what happened there like with the limited things that we know like why was that important like how is that maybe different than some of the ideas that like as a non-denominational like western christian how is that different you know like what are the teachings about that so i'm putting that out there that doesn't have to be what we talk about but that's what called to me when i was thinking about this particular part i mean i will tell you that i my my thoughts i want to hear that I think that's, I, I want to hear that. I, I don't want to skip over uh, the, the specific, the thing, the suffered and was buried. I don't want to skip over mm-hmm. the suffering aspect. And one of, the, one of the reasons and why this jumped out to me immediately was Blessed Seraphim, uh, Father Seraphim Rose in uh, the God's revelation to the human heart. There's this part where he says, our faith, actually is a suffering faith and suffering mm-hmm. is like italicized mm-hmm. and in this suffering something goes on which helps the heart to receive god's revelation mm-hmm. and that to me feels like something to say our faith is a suffering faith is something that maybe you would hear from some catholics roman catholics of a certain bent but i really don't think that you would hear that from most like non-denominational evangelical protestants and i think that that's like a scary to even say that our faith is a suffering faith is the type of thing that I think a lot of modern Western Christians would shy away from. And so just like maybe to draw it all in, like the suffering, the burial, the descent into Hades, what is the connection between all of these? That What is the mechanism that's facilitating this happening? What are we well, looking at? Well, it's freedom and love, which are inseparable. And I think it's also, you know, there's these, there's these hallmarks, you know, I I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to use a phrase that's, that's crass or um, kind of what the word be kind of uh, commercial, you know, commercializing the faith, but there are these points which are, I think, distinct. Um, And I think they are the things that, and again, not to, when I say this, I'm not giving the kind of inference that orthodoxy is a denomination, right? Because it's the church. But, you know, I mean, looking at it, uh, I mean, just from a, 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 just a degree of recognition, right? Not even so much honesty or recognition, you know, it's like, okay, the reality is, is, you know, we believe and know and experience orthodoxy as the church, but we are also understanding that we're Americans and we're converts and we live in a pluralistic context, not just pluralistic in regards to other religions, but Christian confessions, right? So all that being said, okay, um, iconography, um, a whole traditional um, 
whole comma traditional comma um, uh, ecclesiology uh, specifically around the um, the person of the priest, the parish priest, and the the fact that parish priests are are largely married. Um, but then getting even deeper into these things of like, you know, primarily suffering, um, prelist, you know, these, these, these are things that just really, I think for an American, for a convert, for a Westerner, these are things that will like, if, if, you, if they don't jump out at you, it's because you're around someone who doesn't know better, you know, but I mean, these things are, because they're, they're like antithetical to our experience. Um, and so, yeah, suffering is, is, is like the hallmark uh, of being Orthodox, you know? And so, um, well, I should say the awareness and the, the call to grow and the ability to embrace suffering, I guess that's a better way to put it, you know? Um, so the, this aspect of suffering and, and love and freedom, those three things are like a trifecta. They're indivisible from each other. Um, you can't have love without freedom and you can't have freedom and love without suffering. You know, it's just, it's wounded by love as, as, the, as the saying goes, you know, it's, they're, they're absolutely uh, indivisible. So um, I think this is a great place to, to go because I don't even know now, but it definitely seems like the theme and, and it's not intentional, but we're going on like three episodes now where I feel this, I just trust maybe it's the Holy Spirit, I don't know, but there is this common theme that's happening from my perspective, an underlying thread of, if anyone's listening to this and they're interested in, in coming to Orthodoxy, I pray to God that they come to Orthodoxy for the right reasons and understand what they're looking at, you know, because this is not about joining the winning team in a temporal sense. And, and tonight's episode should hopefully put the final nail in that coffin because um, even we take a great, we take the greatest of saints, right? We just celebrated St. Maximus a few, a few uh, days ago. One, like one of the, if not the most celebrated uh, Neptic father, you know, all the intellectual cats love him. And St. Maximus at a very ripe old age is um, condemned by two patriarchs, had his tongue cut out, had his hand cut off, um, suffered, <laughs> you know, suffered. Um, but I mean, no matter who we throw out, you know, as a kind of contender, none of them are gonna top our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was God and suffered and was buried, you know? So to suffer and to be buried, um, to me, there, there's, there's no other way to get around that mystery. There's, and, and people have done it. And this is, I, again, to me, this is perhaps maybe one of the key things about Antichrist. I mean, the Antichrist never, the Antichrist spirit is never one of this um, aspect of true sacrifice and freedom and love. It, it's never that, you know, there's always a measure of vanity. Um, there's always a measure of, of self exaltation. That's, that's wrapped up in that, you know, um, father, what would that look like? Virtue signaling. Okay. <laughs> that's, gotcha. I was just going to say virtue signaling is a great example of like an antichrist expression you know it's like oh i i'm doing this for the sake of others but really it's it's uh it's a posturing and it's an ego and it's a vanity it's a false humility it's a false love it's 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 everything false um well father there's been you know with this this has been one of the things where i have and i've i've not said a lot publicly as I usually, I, I think I'm getting better at this, um, you know, like not just letting my, myself go when, mm -hmm. when I'm having these thoughts, but like the, you know, this trucker thing happening in Ottawa mm -hmm. and what it's kind of turned into. And, you know, I've been trying to express that like, people are like, oh, it's like a 
fun carnival environment down there like all of this and i'm like is it mm, that's <laughs> well no well that's what they're saying like somebody just said to me today they were like yeah i've been down there the last two weekends with my kids they had bouncy castles they had hay bales and all of this and i'm like there's no suffering and because like to me i'm like well then i know that this is only going to work for the the benefit of the the tyrants mm -hmm. because if it's because if it's fun mm -hmm. and you want to go you know i've got in my mind like you know gandhi marching to mar marching to the sea to make salt against the british rules and it's mm -hmm. like people getting arrested hundreds of thousands of people getting arrested you know what i mean gandhi fasting I, I'm, I'm looking at like, you know, the pictures of the, you know, the people marching in the civil rights movement and mm -hmm. down the Edmund Pettus Bridge and they've got their their arms linked together. And it's like because on the other end of that bridge, they're about to get beat up mm -hmm. and and and, you know, and they're singing. And it's like the the, the mood there is not bouncy, bouncy castles. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's it's not hay, hay, hay slides, no. you know, no, I mean, <sighs> You bring up a good point. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I had an interesting day today in some of the interactions I had because um, it, I was reminded again on how seductive the call is to see our faith in the light of, you know, prosperity and, and, I, and I don't just mean in the sense of when we talk about prosperity gospel right of like money and all this stuff but like prosperity of success and I don't just mean like business success I mean like I've won I have victory you know and, and and really understanding what victory in Christ looks like on this side of the veil um I was speaking with someone and I was sharing with them um trying to encourage them you know, they, they were sharing with me that their um, children are sick, you know, and, um, you know, just kind of feeling beat up because the children are sick and like, maybe something's wrong, you know, maybe I haven't done the right thing spiritually. And I was like, no, no, I think you have a wrong understanding of how this works. You know, it's like, I tried to share the idea uh, and the principle about you know, compassion and compassion is to co-suffer. And there's a measure of suffering with people and, and, and having that place of empathy or very much in this idea of when people say, oh, the church is gonna go through the tribulation. It's just like, you know, when you hear that, you're like, no, oh, man, no, 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 that's, that's not how this works. It's like, even though Noah was delivered, he still suffered. That's something that I think people don't realize. Like Noah still suffered. He, he but he was delivered, you know, and, and this idea of being untouchable, it's, it's, it's not proper because the cornerstone of our faith is found in the embracing of, you know, the cross of Christ in every facet of life. That's what we're called to do in every facet of our life. And where we see people interpreting the, the history and the experience of the church outside of that, I think that's, that's where we actually talk about areas where maybe periods of time have not lived up to the call of our Lord, you know, when there's been that kind of, of you know, kind of temporal success, because there's a profound mystery that's not simply hidden, but even revealed in the embracing of the cross and embracing and, and suffering and death. And I think when we lose sight of that, this is, you know, this is perhaps one of the biggest lessons we're not getting, where a lot of us aren't getting this during these last two, well, how has it been two years, two and a half years now? Where are we at, you know? Two um, years, basically. It yeah. seems like longer, but it seems yeah. like a long time. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I fear I fear that people aren't aren't quite getting it yet because the those who those who might say like yeah right on, and they think that that's throwing their lot in with the Covidian stuff, they're missing the point, right? They're, they've fallen over to the left, but the other side where it's just like the wrong kind of resistance, they they will miss the point too because uh, you know 
the way this ends isn't, <laughs> isn't like how people think. You know what I mean? Um, so, Father, you've you've spoken in the past, and I I found it interesting. And and you know we've brought up this idea of people want Byzantium and they want Holy Russia, but you know you've spoken in the past about Byzantium needing to fall in order for the church to spread in order for God's will to be done for Russia, mm. uh, to, to fall. And, and, you know, uh, father Kirill, this Russian priest who came here, he echoed the same thing. And cause he's a mission priest yeah. and saying like, we're not, we as Russians have been notoriously bad mm -hmm. about spreading the gospel mm -hmm. outside of uh, first off. I mean, it's a lot to spread inside Russia anyway, sure. but he said, we've definitely rested on our laurels in terms of spreading the gospel as Russians. And he said, were it not for, were it not for the, the fall, were it not mm -hmm. for uh, communism's rise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, the, the church was not in a place to go out. It had to suffer in order to prosper mm -hmm. in that way. Yeah, I mean, that's St. John Maximovich, just so people don't lose their minds, right? Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I could see some people lose their minds. Like that's St. John Maximovich, that's St. That's John Kronstadt in an even more veiled form than, than the St. John uh, of Shanghai. Um, and this is our Lord, you know, if a grain of wheat falls on the ground and abides alone, but if it dies, it brings fruit forward a hundredfold. So, um, again, I, this is great to kind of clarify, cause I, I throw this out a lot, but I don't know if people really understand this is where I'm coming from. And I'd like to think I'm coming from, uh, from an Orthodox biblical traditional you know, theological perspective, you know, this isn't for me, um, some sort of kind of like crazy theology. This is what seems to be from the witness of the saints, very clear, um, that it's, it's not a kind of, um, it's not a despondent, suicidal, um, despairing, theology right but it, it's it's profoundly paradoxical right he who seeks to lose his life or he who seeks to find his life must lose it for my sake right this is all of these sayings of the lord the fact that god himself came suffered and was buried this for we know why, but the statement would be for whatever reason, people don't get it. It's obviously why people don't get it, you know, because the hardest thing in the world is to embrace your own death. The hardest thing in the world is to embrace actual, genuine, authentic humility. It's the hardest thing in the world, but um, it is the key to eternal life and, and the Lord uh, demonstrates it. So, you know, this reality of understanding and, and at the core of this is understanding how God works and I think that's what everyone kind of wants to know right like well how does God work well I, well God will usher in his economy his grace through suffering <laughs> I mean it's he he hides himself in such a way that only love only authentic love and authentic love can only be given in the light of freedom and suffering he hides himself so that only authentic love can draw him out and that's why for so many that come and they want survival and they want victory and and survival and victory is good in the right sense right um but it's just it's it's important i want people to come and to and to really find the lord and not to get a cheap substitute. And you must have an understanding of this trifecta, right? Of love and freedom and suffering. It, that is the way. There is no other way. Anyone else who tries to find a different way, they come in as a thief and a robber. And that's what all the other religions have tried to do. That's what all the false prophets try to do. They try to come in through you know, intellectual exaltation. They try to come in through, you know, passion-driven temporal success, you know, Islam, 
You know, they, it appeals to the base passions, to animal instincts of survival and dominance. Um, it appeals to um, the eudomic uh, disposition of seeking pleasure. You know, like it, it appeals to all these things and all of them are fundamentally about preservation of self, meaning the ego. True Christianity, orthodoxy alone, alone says no. Love, freedom, suffering. And Christ shows us that's the way to him. He never puts anything forward that he won't do himself. And I think that when you recognize this, then you recognize when, you know, his ways aren't our ways. This is how he spreads his kingdom. You know, this is how orthodoxy spread through the suffering of Holy Russia, through the, through the fall and the suffering of the, you know, Constantinople and Byzantium. I mean, that's, that's how he did it. That's how he does it, you know, and that's how he does it in the lives of, of believers. And um, the life, again, just I keep repeating myself, but the lives of the saints are, are, they are the stepping stone because it's hard to, who, who of us can approach the terror of, of the cross of Christ, right? But those, the saints are these stepping stones by which we begin to kind of see it, you know? And through that, forgive me, through, through that stepping stone, this is, this is where people, this is the paradox. This is where you enter into this place of triumph and seeing your life become something completely other, you know, because again, someone can sound like, well, man, this sounds terrible. <laughs> like, like, why would I ever want to come to the church? But the, the, the trick is, is it's only until you embrace this that you begin to see life um, as it really is. And, and, and it is beautiful and full of awe and wonder, right? Father, you talk a lot about, well, yeah, you talk. The church talks a lot about humility. Mm -hmm. And like, I know that when I first started trying to practice humility, it often fell into the air of self-loathing mm -hmm. and like talking bad about yourself and kind mm -hmm. of just like, I mean, I, 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 it was fortunate for me that like kind of pretty early on, I, I have had it said to me so many times and I cannot remember what the Greek phrase is, but there's this humble words, you know, it's when people say like, oh, I'm a worm, I'm mm -hmm. a sinner, but then you actually like maybe poke at them a little bit you criticize them a little bit and they snap and lash out like they're mm -hmm. like oh how dare you say that about me mm -hmm. um and I kind of was wondering pretty early on I was like okay that's that's no good I can't do that like right now I can't do that in my life I can't have that whole like oh look at me a sinner like I I guess I wondered what does humility actually like what would like an orthodox understanding of humility actually be rather than just sitting around and talking smack on yourself and approaching it from kind of like this intellectual perspective. Yeah, first of all, the sitting around talking smack on yourself, that's fundamentally ego and pride. <laughs> it's just, it's right, because humility is not thinking poorly of yourself, it's thinking less often about yourself. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if, if you are spending your time, you know, this is the thing, Depression is fundamentally fueled by, by pride <laughs> and self-love, you know? And people go like, how is that possible? And it's, it's true, right? Because you are despondent because you're not getting what you think you deserve. The life that you have, the regrets you have, like you, you feel like you shouldn't be experiencing these things, right? This is fundamentally at the core of it. And self-loathing is fundamentally at the core of that as well. Because humility is... is a, a real experience of humility is, is an ability to see outside of yourself. It, it's, an, it's a radical honesty. Because guess what? The world doesn't revol revolve around us. It doesn't revolve around me, you know? It doesn't revolve around you. And when you become aware of this, and for the, in, the, in the name of love, in the name of freedom, in the name of, and, and through suffering, some profound things begin to happen. So humility is thinking less often about yourself, not thinking less about yourself. And any, and any, any jaunt into like self-loathing and anything that isn't kind of playful and, and playful, you know, anything that isn't playful banner, banter is 
fundamentally like ego, you know, e suffering isn't masochistic and it isn't sadist, it isn't sadistic, excuse me. It isn't sadistic, it, it's uh, holy suffering. Um, and this is, this is important because not all suffering is salvific or redemptive, right? There's, there is suffering that people engage in, which is holy, not H-O, but W-H-O, right? Holy, their, their fault. And, they're, and they're, they're the cause of it, you know? And it brings about this kind of despair. But holy, H-O, suffering brings about joy. And someone goes like, I just don't understand that works. Well, when you begin to experience it, um, you'll, you'll know. And when you've ever, if you've ever loved anyone truly, you begin to understand this willingness to suffer for them. You know, this, um, a mother oftentimes will experience this with her children. A husband will often experience this for his wife or for his children. Like these things are even just a shadow in comparison to what God is willing to experience for us. Um, and that's real humility, the God of, creation willing to you know lower himself to such a degree right for for what purpose i think this is the thing that people need to start thinking about this idea first of all in the creed technically you know suffered and buried are put in there to bring home to ram home the reality that we're not talking about a myth that we're talking about God who came in the flesh, light of light, true God of true God, right? Came, was incarnate of a woman, right? The Virgin Mary, um, and truly suffered, right? Because of all the heresies, which are alive and well today and apparently getting more traction, right? Uh, per some recent podcasts, like of really presenting the reality um, the, of Christ, the visceral reality of Christ as, as mythos, as higher meaning, um, excuse me, not as higher meaning, as, 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 as um, cause it is higher meaning, but as, as know, metaphor, as metaphor, or as, as only higher meaning. Yeah. As, as mythical, uh, poetic, you know, epic poetic language, like all of this stuff is, no, no, the, the, the reality is found in that, and this is, the, this is the secret, for what purpose would God serve in, in suffering and being humiliated like that? Um, love, freedom, right? Freedom. So when you, say freedom, when you say freedom, Father, I mean, I, I know that there are people, especially of the libertarian bent, that's a loaded word. I think for probably a lot of a lot of people in our what are we talking about when we talk about freedom in this context of this good question thank yeah. you i was yeah. not gonna ask that yeah not liberty not 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 liberty in the sense of um when we say freedom as orthodox christians um what we're talking about there's overlap for sure there's overlap but we're talking about is, is a call to the highest good, which is love. Um, and I, I know someone might feel like I'm trying to dance around the subject here, but I, we can't talk about freedom without love, right? Because what we're talking about is the state in which a person is able to not simply enter in, but exist in communion. Right, that that is only possible through through freedom. With freedom entailing, yes, the ability to choose, you know, choose. Period. But that choice is always offered and given, and this is the hallmark of freedom. Because I think what people, I think it might be easy to go kind of more apophatic route and say what what freedom isn't, and freedom isn't the um, what people think freedom is, is actually a slave to their passions, right? The ability to, you know, like I want to be, if I want to do whatever X, Y, and Z, I should have the, the right and the freedom to do so. 
So like license, license. They, they view it Thank as being you. a license. They have an unlimited license to yes. do whatever they want to do. Yes. And, and people who are stuck on license, they, they fundamentally find themselves enslaved to their passions, enslaved to their appetites, right? Um, you know, true freedom is, is the conquering of self and, and the ability to be free of self for the sake of other, right? Because it isn't a stoicism where it's just, we want to be free for the sake of free, right? We aren't dispassionate as a stoics just because it's, it's the kind of ideal. We're dispassionate for the sake of the other. You see, that, that's the difference. See, the orthodox way is the fulfillment of every, any type of philosophical movement, and I'll even go as far as to say any type of religious movement that has, if there's any spark of truth to it, it's only truly completed. It's only brought to, to its fulfillment in the, light of, in the light of Christ. And I have to say orthodoxy because orthodoxy is the way of Christ. The Orthodox Church is the full manifestation. It is the church of Jesus Christ. So what that means is there is nothing lacking in that. And it, to not affirm that is to deny the coming of the Christ. You can't just affirm the historical Jesus. You have to affirm Jesus now and his body now, which is the Orthodox Church. And it isn't just simply about the, you know, being a card carrying member because you went through certain rites. It's about a life that's been transformed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the discipleship and experience and transformation through holy repentance as found in the life of the one who's been chrismated and, and received baptism and has participated in the sacraments of the church. That is what it means to be Christian. And that is what it means to be a free human being. You know, the Christian is the true, a Christian, an Orthodox Christian who is, you know, striving all those degrees is the true human being, the true free human being, because Christ is the archetype of what it means to be human. If you wanna know what it means to be human, you look at Christ. If you wanna know what it means to be free, you look at Christ. And people go like, that's a tall claim, but it's like, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> it, it, like there is, no, there is no one else, out, there, there is nothing else outside of that. There is no other way, there is no other way to be free. And I think that's what people kind of don't quite understand. There's something, that, Father, there's something here and it really goes to the last two years with, with freedom. And it's like the antithesis for me, what's going off in my head is fear that, you know, you can't be free if it's, if it's fear that's, and, and fear being preservation of self, right? This ego, this mm -hmm. preservation of self, I must preserve self. And it's like the tyranny that's been locked in over the last two years has been locked in purely with fear. Just mm -hmm. the kernel of fear, and then people will remove their own freedom. Mm -hmm. they, they will deny their own freedom mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, for instance, the church's response. Uh, somebody brought up Montenegro uh, mm -hmm. in, in one of my chats recently, and it's like, prime example, church's response is like, okay, you say there's a plague, procession time. Like, mm -hmm. here we go. It's a, mm -hmm. it's, this, is, that, this means we go into it. Mm -hmm. right. And into it and that and that's going and it meant suffering P priests and bishops arrested mm -hmm. you know orthodox arrested like all of this happening and this this idea of moving into suffering without fear but 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 still like maybe fear is not the right maybe fear is not the right word because i think anybody is going to feel you know is going to have a sense of anxiety about some impending danger to their body or whatever it is and i guess that that's what i'm that's what i'm trying to understand you know somebody somebody posted i've been seeing it over and over um you know I, there's one particular photo i'm gonna have to see who the saint i think saint it's an it's an edward in russia i believe but it's just this picture of him standing the bolsheviks are there putting him on trial he's standing they said, what do you have to say for yourself? The, the, the report says he said, glory to God for all things. Like nine days later, he's executed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a hierarchy. And to look at that and say, 
how, how do we, how could you accept that there's something else, walk into some, a situation like that and even behave in that manner? Well, yeah, and so Captain oh. America, I'm sorry, Father. And Captain America, Winter Soldier, when he's looking at all those like giant helicarriers with all the massive guns, and Captain America said, This isn't freedom, this is fear. You know, like you're talking about, like, oh, we'll just eliminate all of the world's problems with, you know, with these giant helicarriers. And Captain America is like, No, that's not the way that works. And you have to, you're not doing anything for that. And then the last thing I'll say before Father, before I, because I rudely interrupted Father, was that the most free that I have ever felt was, and I'll never forget this, but it was uh, one Sunday and it was probably like within year one of my orthodoxy, but I was serving behind the altar. And part of after that is after people take communion, um, we give, we used to give them wine and bread. I mean, we still do, but I had a cup that we would specifically like bring to their mouth. And I had just taken Eucharist. So I was standing there and there was like this little kid um he couldn't have been like more than five or six and I remember like bending down and like my entire being was like focused on like making sure that this kid got like the wine like like the cup to his lips like my entire being was like wrapped up in that and like for three or four like wonderful seconds I just completely forgot about myself and I was like all about making sure that this kid got the wine and that may sound silly but like I've never, and then, I mean, I'm a person that strives for feeling good. And like, that was like one of those moments of like, for like three or four wonderful seconds, it didn't matter if I felt good or not. It was all about serving that person. Of course, that was just grace on a high level. That wasn't really me. I was just allowed to forget about myself for like three or four seconds. And then I just remember it being so powerful. I was like, came back to myself and I was like in shock. So yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that was, that was that freedom that I perfect felt. love casts out fear. And my wife has had eight kids. And every single time there's a there's serious anxiety leading up to that. But, you know, being aware of the love, she rushes forward into that pain. You know, um, any man who's I mean, men have done it so many times out of love for country and, and love for, for family, you know, they've, they've embraced fear for the sake of love, you know? So this is something that every human being can experience, right? But it's fulfilled completely in Christ is what I'm trying to say. You know, I mean, it's, we, every human being can experience it, whether they're a Christian or not, because every human being is made in the image of God. And there is no experience outside of that, right? We experience love, we experience courage, we experience hope, because these are all aspects of, of what it means to be made in the image of God, right? But this is really key to understand is that because of our fallen nature, because of the fact that we have been given over because of you know freedom and, and because of sin we've been given over to choose um pleasure over the good right the only antidote to that is you know freedom and love and suffering you know and i know it's redundant but the, this is this is that trifecta this is that formula you know what i mean um you know, the father, he bestows freedom upon his creation. You know, the son suffers so that creation can understand and see that love, see that, that freedom as love, you know? And the Holy Spirit brings about the ability for us to enter into that, that freedom through, through love, right? And it's incredible because that, love that the Holy Spirit brings, it's a love that's only possible through repentance. Because repentance is the antidote to, to quote unquote free will, right? It, it, it's like, it is the antidote. And what I mean by that is freedom is the freedom that allows, that allows a human being to do something atrocious, right? That is necessary because 
God loves his creation and God wants, wants man to be free to choose him out of love, right? But this freedom- Because if you don't choose, if you don't choose it, it's not love, right? No, you're, like you're it's a, a robot, you're a slave, right? right? But that freedom is a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. So the antidote to it is repentance because in repentance, that freedom, repentance is the only way that freedom can be truly redeemed. Like there's no other way because a truly free being will choose and does choose sin. Every human being has, has played this out, right? So what can be done? Well, repentance, repentance is given. That's why it says, you know, <laughs> rejoice, you know, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, right? I mean, that's, that's a proclamation of joy. Like you're no longer stuck. And that gets us into the whole descent into hell, but you're no longer stuck, right? You're no longer stuck. Um, I've heard this a couple of times this week about people feeling stuck. And I'm like, anyone, if you're out there, if you're really stuck, I'm telling you, repentance is the way to get unstuck. Now, the question is, what does that look like? And that that's obviously a longer, more personal conversation, but I, I'm telling you, repentance is the way to get unstuck because your freedom has been misused, right? And your freedom has been used to help you avoid suffering. And that avoiding suffering has been the, the turning away from love, right? So you need to redeem your freedom by turning towards love and the turning towards love will lead you into suffering and that suffering becomes the purifying fire by which your freedom is no longer used for evil, no longer used for selfish means, but for good, right? Tsar Lazar of Serbia, the great, the great saint, golden freedom, as it's at least translated in, in English, this golden freedom that he laid his life down, he and his soldiers laid his life down for their people. They were slaughtered by the Turks, right? Well, that golden freedom turned out to be, you know, manifested in their suffering, right? And their suffering was the fruit of their love. So could we say that that stuckness, that the stuckness is in some ways a, an unwillingness to suffer or an oh. unwillingness, an unwillingness to move into suffering is what the stuckness is. That's the place that you've stopped. Nobody who is willing to suffer in the context that we're talking about it as a Christian will ever feel stuck. That's an I absolute, get that. That's I an get, absolute I understand. statement. <laughs> I get that 100%. That's yeah. an absolute statement. You know, that, that's just, it's an absolute statement, right? Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's an absolute that's it. That's an interesting, it's an interesting reframe. It's a very interesting reframe because there's been a lot over the last two years of people saying, you know, doing like people saying, well, doing, doing something is better than doing nothing. And I've taken, I've taken issue with people who say that because I've said, well, that's just, not, you know, there's a lot of, there's like an infinite number of some things that are going to end you up in a worse situation than like the one right thing. Right. And every, it seems like every single time that somebody says doing something is better than doing nothing as a justification for what's being done. The thing that's being done is like a direct ignoring of the suffering to where it's obvious to everybody that like, yo, the next step is this, mm -hmm. like this is it's, it's here. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, we're going to go over here and do this. And it's like, mm -hmm. um, right. Right. The next, no, it's obvious to all of us, even to you, where the next step is. And you're like, well, but, you know, whatever. And uh, I'm going right. to go do this and doing something's better than doing nothing. Right. Which is, this is one of those things where um, we're not talking about a moral system. We're talking about the living God. And the reason why I'm saying it like that is what's wonderful is when not if but when you find yourself making a pig-headed decision you can always repent and god and god has a way of turning that around right and, and to be clear 
it's not like it erases every mistake and it's not like everything, right? But God, through his grace, his wisdom, his providence, and, and the synergy with a, a, a human being that is engaging in repentance, even the things that are of a wicked and, and, and painful nature become glorious. That, I mean, that's why he deserves worship. And that's why um, historical accuracy, political liberty, personal license, they're just, they're cheap trinkets in, in comparison to what we're talking about. And, and this is the thing is, if, if it's history, you know, all those things I just laid out, you're not, I mean, you'll be, a, you'll get something for sure, but you will not get the riches that we're talking about. And they can only be entered into experience. You can't read about this, right? There comes a point where you have to actually engage in it and you have to experience it. There's, there's also something when I lived in New Hampshire, this is, it wasn't clear to me at the time, but there's always, you know, there's those things when you're, when you're in something and you get just a weird feeling mm -hmm. and, and it's like, I don't know, something's not necessarily wrong here, but there's like something missing. You know, when I lived in New Hampshire, free state project and doing like the whole like libertarian thing, and we're going to do this as I've looked back and tried to say like, what was missing? Because obviously there, there was something where I was like, and eh, there's no real reason for me to stay here. Mm -hmm. And I think that if I look back, it was lack of transformation. Mm -hmm. That like, I looked at people who were pursuing license, people who were pursuing quote unquote liberty, people who were consuming, pursuing quote unquote freedom. And as somebody who has had so many transformations in my life and who pursues things in order to, to be transformed, to, to, because I know that I can be something more. I've, I, and we have this inside of ourselves. What I saw was people who would go for years and years and years. And what their desire really was is, I want the world to change so I don't have to change. Mm -hmm. What yeah. can I do so to, to change the world so that I don't have to change and I can stay the same? I saw no growth. I saw no transformation. And if I look back on my own life, my own all my transformation has been through suffering. Like yeah. I can, I can point to where it was to, to what was the catalyst for my transformation. And I mean, you know, suffered and was buried. It's like in my baptism, I, I had to, mm -hmm. I mean, I was, you know, baptized as a 40 something year old person with the history, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> a definite history behind yeah. me that people that, you know, that people know and whatever people think about it. And it's like having to kill that person yeah. basically Right. you know, is, um, I, I, I could have definitely seen had things not lined up, had Christ not come in the way, was I not accepting? I could definitely have seen me continuing on through life, trying to change the world so that I could stay the exact same. Yeah. And, and I, I just want to go there and say, it's the only way, it's the only way to salvation. I mean, that is salvation. Life is suffering. Anybody that tells you different is trying to sell you something or they're lying. Yeah. So, the answer from Princess Bride. I think I botched that quote. Yeah, Let's talk about hell for a second. Let's <laughs> talk about what Christ did. And, you know, we're an hour in and I think we got an hour left. So I thought it'd be kind of cool to, if that's okay with you guys, of course, to switch gears a little bit. Yeah. I could talk about suffering all day. I could talk about the, the, the cycles I felt the my personal experience from this the most visceral is that i used to drive delivery truck for a while and it was a rinky ding truck it was absolutely terrible and it would break down fairly often and i'm talking break down like three and a half hours away and i had this problem with the gas line so i had to like would have to stop and walk like a quarter of a mile and go get gas and the first time that happened i would be like <laughs> you're not you're not going to break me. This is fine. This is not a big deal. Like I'm still just going to keep doing whatever I need to do. Second time I would be kicking and spitting and all angry. And then my third March up to the, to the gas station, I'd be like, your will not mine be done. And that's where like the peace was. It's like getting that like stuff, just like, just like scrubbed away, just like till I was raw and a little bit, but looking back, that's when life was definitely more 
open. It was more like, it was more like, like hydrated. There's more hydration there. Life was more like, it, it was more life there. You know, like they talk about like tears, like bringing the, the heart back to life. And there's like a coldness and a sterileness that comes from pleasure. When you have like your little mm-hmm. utopia, there's like this coldness and this sterileness that happens from it. And you can vibrate at the certain frequency, but everything's got to vibrate at that same frequency. Otherwise your frequency is thrown off. And I can tell when I've been on maybe in my house for too long because I come outside and I'm kind of like looking around at the world a little bit, like what's going on. So that oftentimes feels like hell. So let's talk about (laughs) hell. So Christ is crucified. Uh He gives up his spirit and his body remains on the cross. And he then begins to head down to Sheol Hades, Gehenna. I don't know. Are they all synonymous? Are they different places? Yeah. So, number one, I'm not. I'm not the expert in all this, but I, I will. Sure. I will say that yeah, there's there's a difference in in the terminology, uh, getting into the language. But I think in this context here, I would like to take the opportunity to bring up some things that I think are kind of pertinent in regards of. Um, the place of death and the place of, of quote unquote hell and kind of getting some understanding um, because, you know, everyone who entered into Sheol, everyone who entered into, into um, death um, prior to Christ, they all, you know, were in this place of waiting to whatever degree, you know, and in the scriptures we hear about, Abraham, you know, the, um, the rich man Lazarus being the bosom of Abraham in this, this place of waiting. And I think it's important to understand that um, there is a definitive change, uh, dispensation, if I could use that term, um, before and after the, the crucifixion and death and burial of Christ. It was, it's, it's the game changer, right? And so that, that process and that place, everything is different now. Um, and so when you look at all the, the death in the Old Testament, um, I think there's a measure of um, kind of a weird retroactive hope and expectation that you can read into, again, retroactively, like reading the Old Testament and the slaughtering of peoples, quote unquote, that you can't really read in the same way moving forward, if that makes sense. Because Christ coming and him uh, and, and the forerunner preaching and him coming and preaching and, and breaking down the gates um, of Hades, uh, that moment in time shifted the, the, the place of despair that mankind found itself found ourselves in and so now it's it's it definitely shifts from a type of mixture of despair but hope for those who were the faithful you know when you read in hebrews talking about the hall of faith and all those who you know lived lives in such a way in expectation there's a shift from there and a shift now actually from that point going forward um, to another kind of hope, but in in another kind of hope and a different type of expectation. But uh, there is a new, there's a new dread that, that I would say wasn't there before in the same way because Christ has come. And for many now, countless souls they've died in awareness of the rejection of that freedom and that love um and so they they now find themselves in this state you know in which for many of them the the hell that they were living in this life already but that's that's the state that they that they are um but amplified 
but What's that? Ampl but amplified correct what amplified there's nothing there's nothing there's no veils right everything is is completely unveiled now and so there is no veil of sex or food or pleasure or distraction to kind of dull uh, the burning and the stinging of, of their, their absence of personhood and love, right? Um, so yeah, hell. <laughs> so can I, can I back up really quick? The mm -hmm. smashing of the gates, Christ actually coming down into hell this is like, and I just want to just wanted to say it to make it clear. This was something that like literally actually happened. This is not like wonderful poetic language or anything of like Christ, you know, like he actually like went down into hell, actually like broke down the gates and actually was like, come on, everybody who wants to go, let's go type of thing. Yeah, I, I think the problem is, is that when we speak of Christ doing something literally in this sense, we have to be honest and say that we don't know exactly what that looks like because I don't imagine it's exactly like an Albrecht Dürer wood carving, right? Um, but at the same time, we're not just speaking again about high poetry, right? There, there's... Um, when, when someone is brought into the Orthodox Church, they are brought through the rite of baptism and chrismation. And when someone's chrismated, they are anointed with holy chrism on what's called the gates. And the gates um, will be the, the places in which the senses are, are engaged. Right? So... When I chrismated Cyprian, I chrismated and anointed him over his eyes, his nostrils, his mouth, his ears, his hands, his feet, right? All these places in which the soul engages and the soul is engaged. So we have to understand that gates are places in which entrance happens. So it's not wise to think of it just as I think it is appropriate to say that when we speak about gates in the sense of like you know bronze and and wrought iron gates is like a castle I think there is a measure of poetry that's there because we're trying to understand a spiritual reality but when we say spiritual reality that doesn't mythologize that doesn't make it mythology. <laughs> I'm going to make a board that doesn't make it mythology. Like, so we seal the gates and we're told to watch the gates because that is where we are really engaged by real demonic spirits and forces. So there's something to be said about that. And there's something to be said about the fact that it's through the gates, the ones that we're speaking of, that the soul is fundamentally corrupted. And that freedom that Christ proclaims to the captives, right? It includes the whole of the being and will be culminated in the resurrection of the body, right? And so the resurrection of the body um, and the joining back of the immortal soul with the body this is where, you know, the, these gates have been, <laughs> on the one hand, the gates have been broken down and through the, the, the gates and the power of death, it no longer holds sway over man because everyone will, everyone will yeah. be resurrected. Okay. But there's something more to it because there's also a freedom in which Christ brings the human person into, right? Because Christ is, has sealed, right? The Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit has been given and sealed over those gates, right? And so there's a lot of levels there. This, what, so, the, something you said really rang 
it's just I had this deep feeling of of truth about it. This idea of and and Andrew, when you said, you know, this idea of hell being present, and I think for the first time it really clicked for me at like some sort of a deep level. But this idea of of hell being present even to the living, and that someone could be living in hell except there's all of these veils in front of it, and so they're they're moving with this sort of energy they have this feeling because it's like i mean when you're i i've been there you know to where just every just the entire world you you can tell that there's some that that it's almost like hell is seeping through it's almost like you're sitting in hell but there's these i i don't know there's there, it's a light show and all of these other things to where you you can sometimes convince yourself that you're not in hell but just yeah. this idea of these veils being removed and it's like yeah, that place that you already were, like as how that was, just imagine if all of the things that are even that are mitigating or blocking it a little bit, almost like, you know what I mean? If instead of like the sun, it's like darkness and there's some sort of like light shades in between not making it so dark, but you know, on the other side of those light shades is darkness. Mm -hmm. And if those were to be removed, the darkness is just going to come over the top of you. I've been there. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been there. Then it just rang it rang so it rang true to me. And I think, again, this is one of those places where orthodoxy and the, this ortho, this orthodox understanding is just, it's so true as opposed to this idea of like, ah, there's a dude with a pitchfork and a yeah. lake of fire and you're, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, one of the problems that I think, um, I think we run into is, our thirst for vengeance and our thirst for justice is so strong that it leads us to really bad and wrong places. Um, we talked about this, I don't know, not too long ago, but Saint Silvan, keep thy mind in hell and despair not. And um, understanding that there are no small amount of saints who have had this experience um, of, of kind of touching on the edge of, of hell. And I think this is really important to understand because this is, this is not something of, this gets us back to all the way back to, um, you know, God being the father and, um, any, any twisted idea of God taking delight in the destruction of his creation, in, including the demons, is absolutely wrong. Absolute, absolutely wrong. However, any idea that would say, because that part is true, that therefore there isn't this place of, of hell and separation is completely wrong too. Because... Here it is, freedom and love. The same love of the father that agonizes over the fall of, of the angels and the loss of, of, of any one human soul. That same father who bestowed that freedom, it, I mean, that's what it is. The freedom goes both ways. And, you know, this misuse of that freedom I would imagine uh, is greater, the awareness of that misuse of that freedom and that love is greater than any, you know, kind of vision of material fire that people have. I think it was St. Paisios who he was speaking about, um, talking about the judgment and how um, it was, he said it was almost imagine like watching a, a video screen and just all the wrongs, all the, all the mists, chances of love and just the silence of it, the hell of that silence of, of, of the abandonment of love, you know, um, that is more painful than, I mean, men and women will endure all kinds of physical pain for the love of their country and love of their family, like we said earlier, right? But this, the disappointment of a loved one, you know, 
that that brings a pain far greater than any type of physical pain you can put you can put someone to you know so it's it's going to be profound the hell that people um will experience um yeah and it's 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 never anything that we can we can rejoice in you know i mean the feeling of being that a lot of people i think can can relate to and i know i certainly can you know certainly in my my younger days and women that i was with maybe not like my high school girlfriend you know whatever but when when you're like oh and you know some of that is lust or whatever but love and the idea of being cut off i think that i think the idea i i mean it's a it's it's something for me where i'm like i think of well what could be like the worst things that could happen in my life you know and i think for all of us it's like someone that we truly love either they do something where we just at least it, whether it's for a time whether it's permanently we just there has to be a cutting off there or for whatever reason, they decide that they're going to cut us off. And the cutting off of that is like, just a feeling for me, even saying it is so much worse than, yeah. you know, a knockdown drag out fight yeah. with them in, in the presence yeah. there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it, it's important to remember too, that so much in the fathers teach us that so, so much, if not all of our physical ailments, ailments come out of sin and come out of disordering, right? Even, even down to flatulence, right? The coming from a disordering. And so people can begin to experience disease and death in their bodies because of sin. Well, why would that not also, you know, play out in, in, in with the resurrection of the body in, in hell in that sense, right? Because this, the body doesn't, um, the, we don't feel because we have a body, right? We, we feel because we're able to feel because of the body. It isn't the cause, right? It, it's the means by which we, we can, right? And I mean, I don't mean feel as in just like touch, but experience, you know, consciousness, right? Life. And so I think it's, I think when you begin to understand that, then when we start talking about this principle that the sufferings of hell aren't just kind of poetic expressions of like being cut off, but rather it's the fulfillment of what it means to, to exist in disorder, right? Because the, the height, because what we are is soul, is, is, is spirit and body. I mean, that's what we are, right? And so one of the big problems with people who want to um, mythologize something like hell is that they are falling into a kind of Gnosticism in the, in the back end of there won't be a resurrection. Like uh, our understanding, our, our bodily existence, our incarnational existence, that is existence for us. And that is one of the great terrors and the great, in kind of like, if I could say, we know that the separation from the body and the soul is not natural. That's why everyone mourns at death because it, God create, didn't create death as it says in, in the book of wisdom, right? So this is what Christ does in regards of, you know, undoing that power of death and the resurrection. But remember, everyone's getting resurrected, some to eternal life and some to perdition. And I think when we begin to understand that, that medieval Western understanding of like, devils and pitchforks and like cauldrons. It's not that in the very cartoonish sense of it, right? But it isn't also a poetic understanding of something because we experience, you know, <laughs> someone, so, you, you're experiencing, you'd be surprised how much of what you're what pain you're experiencing is is has a root not exclusively but has a root in sin and so that sin that has been dealt with that affects your body now it's going to affect your immortal body too this is why the fathers are so clear about this life is given to us for repentance because it's a seed that's planted and what will blossom 
in the in the never ending day or night, depending on where you're at. I mean, what's going to blossom is what was sown. So I think that I think that's really important to understand because, kind of getting back a little bit to the the theme we've been having the last few shows is understand what we're getting. What you're what, what if you're coming to this and you're interested in orthodoxy and all this great stuff, understand what you're really getting into. You're not getting into just a kind of system of how to resist tyranny, um, because the resistance of Number one, the tyranny that's coming, no one's going to be able to resist it. <laughs> not, in the, not in the way of like pulling out an A team and finding a great plan and, you know, blowing up bombs and like, like, like you're not getting out that way, right? Um, if you want to know what it looks like to resist the tyranny that's coming, I'll give everyone a, a, good, a good tip. Go read the scene of the prisons. Go start studying the Romanian elders. Go start learning and, and reading and, and um, watching videos of Elder Justine Parvu and Father Roman Braga and Father George Cauciu. Like, go look at these Romanian um, Orthodox Christians and see what they did. Because, of course, look at the Russians, of course. But from my perspective, the Romanians are really more what is probably, not what probably, of what is coming our way. You know, whether whether it will kind of pick up and, and find a, a zenith in our generation or our kids or our grandkids, I don't know. But I do know that it's going to look a lot more like that. You know, the demons found a very particular way. The demons perfected something in Romania. You know, what they were doing and what happened in the Gulag in, in Russia and you know, the kind of crude barbarism of the Muslims, the Mohammedans, um, it, it's all crude, but it was refined and, and brought to truly a demonic level out of just a simple humanistic barbarism in Romania with the re-education and the, the seeking to take away personhood. This is really getting into hell. And this is really getting into this experience because it wasn't just physical, um, the deprivation it was an actual attack on the soul and the erasing of personhood um and that's terror that's that's real terror and there can be no freedom with that that like that personhood is tied up in the freedom right yeah. because it is uh -huh. in the personhood that we experience uh -huh. the move towards love it's the person who's doing that that's and if true. that's taken away then there's like that that the, the, that that we're cut off from even the capability of it that's right that's right. And it's only by a great mystery of God's power. And that power that's hidden in, in the stillness and the small voice, the same small voice that came to Elijah, this is the one that preserved these, these Romanian confessors. Because even, uh, I believe it was Father George Calci at one point in time was like driven to suicide almost. So we're, we're not talking, of, we're talk, like, this is one of the things that I think is really important too for, um, and again, God bless all of you. And I truly mean this. I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. God bless all of you who are, you know, coming from a more political bent, whatever that is. And I pray that um, you find our conversations encouraging, but I'm telling you, um, you sh if you don't know what I'm talking about, spend some time learning about the Romanian elders because you need to get a kind of little bit of a wake up call to what, to what is out there and what, what, what is more than likely coming our way at some point in time, you know, because the, it's incredible what the, the, the regime in, in Romania did. It's like, it's unreal. Um, it really, it, <laughs> the, the terrors that you're that that are kind of put forward in the fiction of 1984 and such it pales in comparison to it it's real life what what was what was done and i think it's important to understand that because the the fortification of the soul and and this is ultimately what we've been talking about this whole time in this whole project right the fortification of the soul and the ability with you know, as much as it's possible and only by God's grace to maintain on the narrow path, that's the only way anyone can survive it, right? Um, 
it's, it's the it's the only way. And I think for a lot of people, and this is one of the things I worry about, people can get um, lulled into a really a false sense of security of I'm in a rural area, I got weapons, I got food, I got this and that. It's like, you really don't understand like what's happening, right? You really don't understand because this isn't just, yeah, there is a temporal physical tyranny that is kind of like looming, but that's not the hard part. The hard part is the spiritual uh, tyranny that is already here and it moves quicker than any army, any physical army can. I think a lot of people that, yeah, thank you for that, Father, because it, 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 it now, what, what I just realized right now with you saying that is there are a lot of people, those individuals that you're talking about, I'm in a rural area, I've got guns, I've got this, and I talk with, the, with, I, I talk with folks like this, I'm friends with folks like this, and there's always some sort of disconnect between what I'm saying, what I'm trying to communicate to them, and I've been searching for a way to even communicate what I'm trying to communicate to them. And it's, I think from what you just said, it's like they're, be, they're behaving, and this will be very helpful in the future. The folks who are like that, who are saying, oh, I've got guns, I'm in a rural area, all of this, are operating as though the enemy that they're facing is coming to uh, try to take their stuff mm -hmm. or try to take their land. Mm -hmm. And like, you know what? Yeah, if there's an enemy who's coming, who's trying to take your stuff, who's trying to take your land, what you've got is that's how, that's how you deal with it, mm -hmm. right? Like that, that's, that, that could very well be effective, mm -hmm. right? But the enemy that's coming, like you said, and, and I think that it's important, like Romania, um, the, the little bit that I know, now I, now I got to go read the saying of the prisons because that's, um, the little I know of the aftermath of that is that it was the aftermath of that was even hell. It's still mm -hmm. in many, many areas still. hell to this day. Yeah. The orphanages and yep. all of the, it's yep. in, yep. in like, you're just like, how could he, how could this even be humanity? And it's like the leftover of this. And so it's like, yo man, they, what the enemy that you're about to face doesn't want your land. It doesn't want any of that. It wants to cease for you to be a person. Mm -hmm. Like you'll still be walking around alive. Mm -hmm. But like this thing that you know of as you as a person, mm -hmm. the goal is for that to be ripped away from this, the rest of your being. Right. And I don't think people can fully comprehend that that's the enemy that they're facing. They just can't even wrap their heads no, around I it mean, they don't have I the mean, vocabulary. No, what if, what if I was to tell you this? What if either way, right? Because that same enemy will gladly let you keep your stuff. <laughs> it in some situations it'll be much more uh eff efficacious effectual much more even efficient to help you to have you keep your stuff or to give you more stuff or to give you more stuff um and that's see this i mean this is just the thing like uh, it is the world bath it is really understanding this like I've never physically walked on a tightrope. Well, I've walked a couple fences in my life, not many, because I'm a big dude, right? It, the few times I've had to do it, it's, it's never been easy. It's never been easy. And it just living this life now and trying to practice what I preach, it's not easy. But I know it's the only way. Because I've been, I've been and I've fallen to the left and to the right in my life. I, I, I know what it is and I'm telling you. And I have a feeling there's someone out there who knows exactly what I'm saying to them because there's a comfort. And that comfort, when you feel it, I think it's kind of a little bit what Andrew was saying earlier. When you feel that comfort, something's wrong, man. When you feel that comfort, something's wrong. Um, and this is, this is the power and the strength of the Orthodox tradition is Orthodoxy gives you the, the discernment or the means to discernment and the tools to, to know when you have gone to the left or to the right. And then to, to as, as much as it's possible, 
with God's grace to maintain that balance once you get back up on your feet. But that's that's what it is, you know. Um, yeah, if you fall, not a big deal. You made a mistake. It yeah, happened. you're you're going to fall. Yeah, you're going to fall. But the question is, is will you will you get up or will you kind of like stay stay safe and warm? Again, you know, the scene of the prisons. I would just encourage everyone, you know, to to pick that up and to begin to read it because there's some profound insight in there, you know, or again, any, any of the Romanian, like again, start reading my Romanian elders, start reading El de Gleopa, you know, read about, uh, yeah, George, Father George Calciu. I mean, we're talking about Father George Calciu had a family, all that. I mean, he's, he went to prison for decades, you know? I mean, it, it's, that to me, that's where we can that's where we can start talking about resistance in that sense with with some confidence with them with a kind of almost a bulletproof confidence because the resistance that they offered it wasn't um, a resistance for stuff it was a resistance for Christ and for personhood right they were they were willing to give up family and freedom right they were willing to give up liberty right, excuse me, they were willing to give up liberty and to some degree physical freedom, but, f but they did it to maintain true freedom, right? That's, that's the difference. And they were always offered like, just like back in the ancient times, just a pinch, just a pinch of incense. No, just renounce this, renounce that, this and that. And yeah, yeah, may God grant us all the strength to, to say no if the time comes to us, you know? Um, I have one last this, question. Go ahead, Father. Um, and this can be a short one, um, but I've always kind of it's been baffling to me that it's it's foretold that the enemy is going to lose, like their spiritual enemy is going to lose, like the wolf of souls is going to lose, like at the end of the day when all things are. So, what's the deal? Why are they still fighting? You know, like why are they still being jerks? Like essentially, like. If they know that they're going down, why are they still, you know? There's this great line. Um, I've, I mean, <laughs> surely we've all heard it. And, and if, if nothing else in like a, a G.I. Joe cartoon somewhere, but like uh, if I'm going down, I'm going to take them with me, you know? Okay. Really? It's that? Like that's that's what they've got to do? I don't know. You know, I, I would be careful to, it's not that flippant. I mean, when you begin to understand. Um, That's kind of maybe what I'm looking for is that deeper understanding. Yeah, like, here's the thing. You're a good man. And so you don't, you've never experienced that level of depth of hatred. You've never experienced that level of depth of just, your exist, your whole existence is, your whole existence is a non-existence of rage and, and envy. Um, and so, you know, some people say, well, you know, the devil thinks he has a chance. No, the, the devil knows his, he, he doesn't have a chance. He, he knows, the Father's teaches that he, he knows he has a limited time, but he rages. And the hatred for, the hatred of God is all consuming. And Good for you that you can't understand that. And I, I mean that truly because it's, it's um, the few times I have encountered evil, right? And I don't just mean angry, passion, you know, angry, violent human beings. I mean, demonic evil. I've never, I mean, I remember it's just as clear to me now as it was then, maybe not as visceral in the fear, but. I've never experienced, I've never experienced hatred like that before. I've never experienced just, uh, just evil, evil like that before. Um, and so- Well, it's, a, it's an inversion of Christ's willingness to die out of love, to yeah. encounter death out of love. It's to say, oh, I'll die out of hatred. If yeah. what it takes is, what it takes for, for me to get you is for me to die in the process, I hate you so much, I'll do it. Yeah. It's direct inversion of Christ saying, I, I, love, I love you so much that I will do it. It's perfect. 
Yeah. That was my question. What's that? That was it. That was my question. Oh. That's that was my my lack of understanding because I've heard people talk about it before. And I mean, I don't want to act like that, like I don't get it all the way because I, I do get like, OK, yeah, I guess I can see that level of hatred and evil. And yeah, I could see that. Like, I don't want to act like that. That's just lost on me. I just didn't know if. Yeah, I guess that answers that. I didn't know if the devil still thought he had like he still had a shot, you know, like there's some way he could still pull this around or anything like that. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things to understand is that, you know, the 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 demon, the angels have a. Their, their freedom is not like ours, right? Okay. So the instance in which they fell, right? Um, the instant that they fell, I mean, they were locked perpetually into that, it, that cycle, like that movement, like they're forever moving towards that, right? And that's, that's one of the things they don't about die. No, no, not like they don't. They don't die in the sense of termination, ceasing to exist. Okay. They died spiritually in the sense of they are forever losing their. They are. They are shadow. You know, shadow has no existence. Okay. You do you understand what I'm, when I when I, you can right yeah. like you see a shadow but it has no existence right that they, they are shadow in that sense they have no existence they are they are forever moving in in into absence of life whereas the angels who kept their post are forever moving and and growing in in the in just like we just like we will right God willing. Um, in life because that's that's god right so the demons are moving away from god moving more and more into shadow and we are forever moving more and more into right but there is this you know there is this reality that the the existence of the reality of the of the demonic is a reality of, again, and I think this is where if people put the emphasis on that, it would help kind of untangle some of these knots. The existence of the demons is, is proof. I know this sounds weird, but it's, it's one of the many proofs of the existence and the love of God, right? Because it is God's love for them that he chose to create them. Okay. Right. His love was daring enough to, to just knowing the possibilities, knowing all those things still chooses out of love to create, to create beings and entities that would choose otherwise. That's love. And it's, it goes, we don't even, <laughs> we, we barely begin to even scratch the surface of what that means because we just think, why would I do that if I know this and that? But it's like, because we don't really know what love is, right? Love for us is always contingent upon what we deem to be a happy, successful end. But that's not love. That's, that's still wrapped around our preconceptions and our determined ideas of what, you know, the, the good is, which is oftentimes pleasure. Sure. Right? But God is love, and he, he created both us and the angels out of love and, and gave that freedom, you know, to us a greater degree through death, because it's through death that we're able to have a cap, if you will, to our life. And that repentance, you know, repentance being that, that place for life, right? So then I don't, I don't want to drill on this too hard because this is probably just a separate conversation, but so then really quick, why did some fall and others didn't? Was it a personality thing? Yeah, I mean, there's, there is, angels fell from every rank. Okay. Angels fell from, from every rank. 
So it's like asking, you know, a man and woman at, you know, a man and a woman in Soviet Russia, you know, at the at the turn of the, of the revolution had six children, you know, five of them became communists and helped execute the priest and, you know, two of them didn't. Like, how do you, why is it that some fell, some didn't? Why is it that some become priests and love God and others don't? It's, I mean, there's a mystery that's beyond me, that's for sure, but we know that that Sure, that sure. There was, there's, there's, there is some spark there that chose and that chooses. I think one of the reasons why I'm hesitating so much to go down this line of thinking is I'm looking to flesh this out in the way I'm looking to like flesh out like Tolkien lore is to like truly understand it like in the way that like A plus B equals C. Okay, I get why this happened and this happened. And I know that like, a lot of times when it comes to this kind of stuff, I just have to accept that like it happened and that's what happened. And like, okay, but why, what is, so does that mean that like Archangel Gabriel and Archangel Michael, maybe like one of them likes peanut butter and one of them doesn't like, is it like a personality thing? Like they're two separate things. Cause I've, I'm coming from like a Protestant, like understanding of like angels are just kind of like nice things that show up when God has something to say. But like through orthodoxy, I've learned that like a bunch of our relationship through God is through the angels and both good and bad. So it's like, OK, so then why did Angel X, you know, decide to like not stick around? And then why did Angel Y decide And you spoke on that spark? But I was like, there's some definite answer there that I'm like wanting it to be precise. And I don't think it, it's it's not going to satisfy me in the way that I want it to. And that's OK. I'm, I'm cool with that. That's fine. But like, I'm just like, yeah, I think I'm trying to flesh it out in a way like I'm reading like a Orthodox or not, not an Orthodox, but like a wiki lore on like Lord of the Rings or something like that. Yeah. And that's something you really should work on like distancing. And that's, yeah. that's one of the things about that's, this is a great example of where, um, you know, we, especially here, like we, we like to, to take narrative and experience music, all these things, and, and all these things can point us to God and point us to experience of, 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 and, you know, some sort of kind of enlightenment, illumination, even perhaps um, it can, it can be a means of which we enter into, it can be used as like a cipher and, and help us with language. You know, where we fail in other aspects of language, but there's always this problem of um, the shelf life and you know metaphors and things like that going so far. And this is where discernment is super important because when you find yourself hung up on something like in this instance, which is a great example, it it's important. You know, the orthodox way would be to learn to first of all, recognize that you have this proclivity to be driven to a point of potential error because of, um, of an appetite, right? The appetite for narrative or the appetite for fantasy, whatever. Have to be satisfied. Having to be satisfied, right? Um, and, having, and having it to be laid out in a certain way, right? Um, and the, the problem with it is, is, you know, narrative, story, uh, is very linear and it's it's not it in this sense it can be now become counterintuitive to a kind of noetic understanding yes right so this is really important because um, it's a lot like when someone's learning to paint you know someone can have natural talent but there comes a point where if you're going to really progress you have to at the very least recognize that you have some, you've learned some bad habits in your own kind of like natural talent. And, or I dare say, sometimes you need to, un, to unlearn now an old or bad habits so that you can actually progress now. There becomes like this plateau where you have to say to yourself, okay, I'm either kind of good where I'm at or man, I might have to make a little bit of a U-turn and then move forward, right? Sometimes you have to take some steps back 
and unlearn some things in order to like take a next step forward. And I think this is, I'm really glad this came up because this is another thing in regards of, you know, um, like this, like, I think what we do here is great because we have a lot of fun in this and you know, in our project and our platform, but there's moments like right now where we're, you know, we're, we're always talking about something serious and we try to present uh, our tradition and our life in Christ in a, in a way that's, you know, fun, you know, that's enjoyable, that, that, that's down to earth. But there's these moments where I got to stop and say, you know, when we start peering into these things, we should always, you know, just step back and recalibrate our sobriety because you can't understand these things like a movie or like mm. a comic book or something like that, that because it's it's not linear in that sense um and it's definitely m more deeper than it is wide i just i was talking with someone about that last night and and it's clicking for me actually today these things are de definitely more deep than they are wide and it's important to realize that sometimes the the way in which we've learned to read a story, we, we got to kind of step back in, or, in order to get the, the bigger picture because we're not dealing with, we're not dealing with intelligences like we understand it. Like when we're talking about angels and we're talking about the fall, we're talking about hell, we're talking about all these things. It's like, these things um, are very, not only they're very serious, but they're very hard to approach with, um, unless you're willing to disengage certain presuppositions, right? Because the presuppositions, that's, that's what we are all so tempted by because we wanna figure it out. No one likes to feel out of depth. No one likes to feel confused, um, but the weird thing is the only way to get understanding is to just kind of embrace that being out of your depth for a period of time, because that's how we learn to swim, if you will, you know, it's tough. It's, like, it's an Eastern way of gaining knowledge, correct? It is. You, you accept the, the reality of the thing that you don't understand it and then the divine knowledge will be given to you rather than you rationally building up your little tower, say of Babel and trying to get up like to the heavens. It or is. of the science trademark. Yeah. I mean, hasn't that been the whole thing over the last two years? It's like, oh, if we just had more information, more information, more information. And then it turns out that like, oh, those Orthodox priests who were like, actually, we just need to do a procession. It's like, you know what? If we just would have done a whole bunch of processions, actually, it turns out you're going to find uh, out that it actually just would have been better. The whole, everything like, would have worked out better. What the heck do I do with my kid? Try and figure it out. Google it. Wait, no, 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 no. Let's go say exactly. like a prayer real quick. And then let's ask to see if something happens after that. And then lo and behold, usually shocker, God is faithful and a little idea gets put in my head or something. Father, is the reason why it's the kind of not linear is because it exists outside of time? Some of well, it, it doesn't exist outside of time in that sense, because there's different types of time. Oh, boy. All right. I think I just got to stop there. <laughs> that, that's, that's all I got. Well, is, is, is eternal, if something is eternal, that's not necessarily outside of time, right? It like right. encompasses all time. There, all time is inside of it. Right. Because there's angelic time. Oh, man. Right. There's, there's eternity. There's angelic time. There's temporal time. Right. And we can even begin to like kind of break that down uh, because I would I would submit to someone that what we experience as liturgical time is kind of a kind of a like mixture of both. So, you know, there's there's just there's different experiences of time, and I think that's another thing is you know, <laughs> um, why why do we like well why did this happen? Was it we we ask that out of fear because what we're scared of is like how can I avoid falling into it myself? Or how can I find some sort of way to kind of, you know, master the situation to, out of a sense of security, right? Um, and that's fear, getting kind of, bringing it full circle. Like, I think it's really great if people can kind of step back tonight and just think about all those points in which we're all guilty of it, right? This is part of our, our fallen human condition. 
But if we can work towards really discerning and recognizing ourselves, this compulsion for information and for mastery of information and recognizing that at its root, yes, there's ego and hubris, but like there's fear and beginning to really address that fear because the saints, as I've studied them and the ones that I've, that I've studied and tried to get to know intimately, one of the things that I find consistent in, is, in them is there, this, there is this banishment of fear. And that banishment of fear is replaced by an increasing in faith, right? And so that faith and that growth and faith and trust begins to bring them to this place where there is no need, there's no compulsion to understand in that sense. There's only a compulsion to love and to experience. Because faith and fear can't exist in the same space. It can't exist it's, in the same yeah, space. They, I've yeah, heard that makes a lot of sense. Courage is just fear that said it's prayer. Like they told me that in sobriety early on. That they're just like, hey, courage is just faith. Or courage is just fear that said it's prayer. Hmm. So I don't know. I don't know if that holds up theologically, but it was really nice at the time. And it really <laughs> helped me through a lot. So yeah. Yeah. So gentlemen what is the one it kind of to bring it back but in another way to what we we're talking about at the beginning what is the well, it's like a musical artist that you just do not get the hype i just you just don't get it it's just like everyone loves these guys and you're just like i just don't get it i don't know taylor what's... swift all right taylor swift i get Taylor Swift. I, I get it. Like I I've listened to a fair amount of Taylor Swift and I'm not saying the music is good, but I'm saying she's a very, <laughs> no, it's, it's a spell. No, 100%. Like that's what I'm saying. When I'm saying I get it, it's a spell. She's weaving a spell without a doubt, because there's this certain feeling that's brought up inside you when you're listening to Taylor Swift of like, you're like talking with like a kind of a good old girlfriend that you know, like because she presents herself as really down to earth and she's talking about herself in this like really humble way. And it's kind of like fun, but it's all about boys. It's to the fact it's to the point where my wife has was just checked out some of her new stuff a while ago. Not a big mm -hmm. deal. She wasn't really that into her, but she had to stop listening to her because my three and a half year old daughter suddenly was singing the songs no was becoming obsessed with boys at my church oh well that's the spell that's, that's the taylor swift spell when i say yeah. i get it with taylor okay, swift I see. that's I see. what i get that it's not even music it's, it's not programming even because it's programming. my innocent three and a half year old little daughter would suddenly just be like i want to go stand by the boys and she'd go want to stand by like teenage boys she has no concept of this she has nothing. So we had to stop listening to Taylor Swift around her. That's what I'm saying. I get Taylor Swift. I'm not saying I'm like, oh my gosh, no, she's a amazing. I mean, she is, but it's like, it's a total spell. It's a total spell. So interesting. That's that. interesting. Father, do you have one? Yeah, no, no, I just hang the DJ. <laughs> I just, it's all terrible, man. <laughs> It's all terrible. None of it's good. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to be Doomer Docs today. <laughs> like it's, all, it's, it's all terrible. I don't... Do you I have don't someone know. you don't get, Andrew? I mean, the obvious is the Beatles. I've never got the Beatles. Yeah. I'm just like, I do not get what the hype is. I don't get why people just love every... I've heard it said, I've never looked at it, but every single Beatles song as its own wikipedia page yep and i just don't get it have you have you ever have you ever watched hard day's night the movie no okay so here's what's interesting so having been on reality tv right yeah. i'd like and and with like really great producers so like real, reality tv on like a, a big network that was trying to do big things right for a long time i would always hang out with the producers talk with them i got to understanding like how do you make a great documentary? How do you make great reality TV? What are you trying to do? And again, it's like this spell. It's like a programming thing, right? They were the first reality stars 
Hmm. That's interesting. Okay. If you watch, if you want to understand the Beatles, you have to watch Hard Day's Night and you have to understand it in the context of nobody knew who the Beatles were. Nobody even knew the Beatles' music. Hard Day's Night came and showed in the theaters in the States and in the UK before anybody knew their music. And so this whole thing of the Beatles of like, oh, John is this one. Ringo is this one. George is this one. Paul is this one. That's all created in Hard Day's Night. And Hard Day's Night is basically a reality movie. They play themselves. They're trying to get to like a concert. There's this whole thing that's going. It's shot in an entirely new way that nothing had been shot in at that time that makes it look like real, really real and documentary like. It feels very ad libbed. And from the beginning, it goes right to your Taylor Swift thing. It opens with them trying to get to a train for where this whole thing is going to start because they're trying to get to like the show. And there's a, an army of girls chasing them. Okay, I know that. But, jet- they were, but they were unknown at the time. So that's how you have to view it. Like this is an unknown band and they got an army of girls to chase them. And at the end, there's this like helicopter scene and all of this. So basically they were the first Kardashians. Hmm. If you understand the entire, then you can understand the entire trajectory of the, the Beatles that basically a spell was just dropped on the Western world and it had no, it, it had no like um, defenses Substance. against d- defenses against the hmm. spell that was dropped and it's hard day's night. It's worth watching just from a standpoint of like understanding, wow, the control mechanism that was dropped. Pretty crazy. Wow. That's the Beatles. Wow. That's the Beatles. Yeah. I saw all the tropes, all the tropes that we used on re- in reality TV were all invented in Hard Day's mm. Night. All of them. Wow. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's very interesting. Mm-hmm. But I thought of a way to rephrase this question really quick for Father. Um, as we're as we're closing out, Father, not a pop band. What is a band that's generally respected within like your circles, quote unquote, that you don't like that everybody else likes? Because mine, right out the bat, is probably all of the big four of thrash metal, but especially Slayer. I, I don't like Slayer. I don't like Megadeth. I don't like Metallica. And I don't like Anthrax. Any yeah. of no Metallica, huh? No Metallica either. You don't like Metallica? No. And yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to take the stance of being like it's terrible because it's not it's not bad music. I just it's just not for me. I love thrash metal. I absolutely love thrash metal. A couple of years ago, there's this new wave of thrash metal. I was loving it. It's amazing. Um, Power trip. Metallica is so accessible though. Like for the genre, they're so accessible. Oh, sure. And I mean, even their less accessible stuff, like, and I'm not going to act like, like what is For Whom the Bells Tolls is not a sweet song. Like that is a cool, mm-hmm. by any mm-hmm. like measure, if you're at least a little bit of a metal head, like from the beginning. Even, of even the- if you're not, if you just like, mm-hmm. if you just into music. Yeah. You're at, le- you're at least like, I'll give this a listen. Okay. 100. Now. You're not turned off. Now, ha- hardly anything is redeemable about Slayer. Right, and exactly. Slayer's <laughs> just pretty terrible all around. Um, I I have a long-standing thing against Slayer, except the couple of the riffs that everybody likes, like Raining Blood is sweet. Like the no 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 Like, that's a sweet... And then also, all the... On License to Ill by Beastie Boys, all the guitars solos was done by... What's his nuts? Uh, from Slayer. I, of course, I can't remember his name right now. And Fight for Your Right, the party has like one of the worst guitar solos of all time mm. on it. When you listen mm-hmm. to that song, listen to guitar solo. It's now he kind of makes up for it in No Sleep Till Brooklyn because that's actually a pretty Great. sweet guitar yeah. solo. But Fight for Your Right is just one of the worst guitar solos I've ever heard. But anyway, probably those four for me. Slayer sucks. Father. <laughs> um oh man i don't know i mean there's so much i hate um (laughs) i i just you know i i never um i don't know like i never got 80s glam i never got that sure yeah Um, i never i never got like molly crew like none of it there's none of it i like terrible you know terrible yeah that stuff but that all. that would qualify as that band. I mean, Motley Crue 
still to this day rabid fan base yeah, rabid just, fan base i never there's there isn't one song that i like there isn't one thing i've ever liked about them i just and it, and it's not even glam as a genre because like new york dolls and hollywood brats and yeah. uh, sweet and uh sweet is you know so awesome all that stuff from like you know the late 70s and all that glam stuff from the late 70s is cool you know the heartbreakers all that but just that 80s stuff is just uh yeah, i never what was with that snare that snare that everybody used in the know. 80s that big echoey sounded like you're hitting like a big cardboard box instead of like a mm -hmm. snare drum oh it was just ever since i was a kid it's just been so viscerally awful to me i forget i forget what that effect is it's just i'm blanking on it right now but it has I, but it has to do with reversing you actually take the it takes the sound and it reverses it yeah it does the yeah like that and then you add it over the top yeah i forget what that's it's got a, a term but that was 80s all the drums <laughs> on in every genre of music in the 80s that was the 80s drum yeah but there really is bad. a way to do that correct because father maybe i'm misremembering but like candle mass uh-huh like they're yeah. they're talking yeah, you can do it in a way that's kind of like it's creepy cool and ambient you know and mm -hmm. just like whatever but yeah most of it's not good i forget about candle mass and then i remember them and i'm like that one album by them whatever with bewitched whatever yeah. that song is whatever that album is that guy is so ridiculous there's like probably like 10 people who are listening to this right now who are like yeah candle mass like so i'm not one of them i'm not one of them <laughs> oh cyprian i'm gonna send you a video after this send me send me send me video send me. for bewitched oh man okay, send me <laughs> oh good it's so cool and it's this big operatic guy and he's got this huge afro and he's playing this monk who's like going around and bewitching people and it's like okay that sounds fun it's and at the end all these uh like thrash kids with like converse are all like marching in like order and like oh it's it's send it. super, super, send it. Send super it. cool yeah i'll send it when we're done recording um all right thanks folks um i think we'll be back next week on schedule and everything like that um i don't I don't think we have any really big announcements. I think another Q and A eventually is because people are asking a bunch of questions still, and I'd like to gather those up and answer them. Yep. You know, maybe within the next couple of months or something like that. That'd be cool. Otherwise, you can continue to reach out to us. Um, well, I guess more Cyprian and Father because um, their contacts is better, but whatever. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys.